Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, four power-packed verses. So let's don't waste a second. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you that you reveal yourself. Our sin, our spiritual deadness blinds us from seeing who you are. Our enemy desires to blind us. So thank you, Father, that working through our sin, our spiritual deadness, working against our enemy, you reveal to us the good news of Jesus. You reveal to us the gospel. And Father, you woo us and win us, and we know that all the work of salvation is yours. We are as helpless babes at our, at our conversion. We're, we're made into a new creature, and we're immediately, immediately, we're just babies born from the womb of heaven, can do nothing for ourselves. So whatever good comes to us, it is a work of your hand. And however we grow up on the milk of the word and the meat of the word is because you have produced the milk and you have produced the meat and it's your hand who feeds it to us. So now, Father, for those souls who will join together at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night or catch up later on as they have time to look at this word, May we see how critical your word, your holy scriptures are to our very soul and sanctification. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to break open this beautiful bread of life and have you feed us as your sweet little children. You are a tender, loving father with a mother heart. And we see you caring for us. Watch over us in this moment and draw us near. Give us understanding. Illumine our minds. Help us, God, to meet with you. In Jesus we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Of course, I'm reading uh, here from the English Standard Version. Um, and you follow along in the translation the Lord has giving you the grace to, to prefer. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. That last part was cheerful, right? So I want to just jump right in. Um, but I want to start with a very personal testimony. So some of, you, some of you guys have heard me say this. I was eight years old and um, man, heard the gospel. And I want to come back to the gospel in a moment. I heard the gospel clearly, and I heard, I understood that I was a sinner, which I already knew that even at eight years old, you know, but that my sin had offended God and would bring the just wrath of God against me. And that I would sit under the just wrath of God through eternity if I did not become sheltered in Christ. I was eight years old, Labor Day weekend, 1979. And I rejected God. In that moment, I rejected God. But my grandmother gave me a little brown Bible. 
It was the whole Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Gave me a little brown Bible, and I began reading it. I began reading it. Um, somewhere, I think it's the fourth grade. The Gideons came to our school, third or fourth grade. I really, I think it was fourth grade, and they gave us a New Testament with the Psalms and the Proverbs. And I don't know if you remember these, but I had a little red one, and I wore bib overalls a lot, and I would carry that Bible in my pocket. Now I was under no illusion, even at that young age, that I was a Christian. I had been made to rightly understand by some adults in my life, by the Scripture themselves, that. To yield to God in Christ Jesus was to be adopted into the family, saved from, from wrath, rescued from being commanded by Satan, delivered from the hopelessness of my flesh. I, I, I knew it, and I knew I was no Christian, but I was reading the Word of God. Now, 100% of my salvation was the work of God. The Father sent the Son, the Son obeyed the Father, the Spirit, the Son sent the Spirit, the Spirit was wooing people, calling us to love God, and the only way we could do that is through, by being reconciled through Jesus. But his main tool in my life was the Word of God, and I did not see that coming. I thought it was the most interesting book on the face of the planet. When I was eight years old, my grandmother said to me, all the answers to life are in this book. I thought that was an amazing statement. I was blown away by, it. She, you know, I was like, all the answers of life? Turns out she's right. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't mean it answers all the issues we will encounter in life. It doesn't answer, you know, like the Bible doesn't tell you the formula for making good asphalt. But of the, of the essence of life, of, of, of what God has made, of, of God himself, of the nature of man, of the, the origin, meaning, morality, and destiny of mankind. The Bible has those answers. And so it was on March 2nd, 1997, in my living room, under the mighty working of the Holy Spirit, that all those years of reading the word came to bear in my life in such a way that I, you know, the Calvinists call it irresistible grace. Um, I, I know I was under a mixture of divine fear and divine acceptance that both of those, you know, I finally saw that, you know, it is, there is, you know, it is, a real fear to think about the wrath of God being upon me for a moment, the full wrath of God upon me for a moment, not less for an eternity. That, that, that's a real fear. But a real warmth against that fear was to know that through Christ Jesus, I could expect to escape condemnation. God, Christ Jesus is God's escape from condemnation. Now, that being said, um, that being said, uh, I, I want to say a couple of words real quick on the gospel. Like, you know, I, I want to pick on something here, and it's likely to make somebody mad for just a moment. But when you hear me out, you know, um, you know, I hate I hate the misuse of the word gospel. For example, somebody would say it's gospel music or it's or it's southern gospel music or whatever. And like, you know, that that makes gospel into a modifier. You know, gospel, the gospel is not a modifier. The gospel is the good news that Jesus, Jesus reconciles God to man. That is the gospel. Paul would even say, the apostle Paul would say, if anyone else preaches some other gospel, oh boy, run away from him. All right, so if we say something is gospel music, that's not necessarily wrong, but it really should be music of the gospel. And if it's not music about the good news, then it might be Christian music and worthy of singing, but it's not music of the gospel. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say that? 
when Paul and his missionary team went to Thessalonica, as recorded there in Acts chapter 17, they did not go singing, you know, heartwarming songs of sentimentality or faith or family. They did not go, you know, just doing good works and hoping someone would, you know, hear about Jesus and, and, and turn. No, they went to preach the good news that is the mandate of the church. Now, people who have received the good news, okay, they will do good works. But the mandate of the church is the good news. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say that? Because when Paul says here, you receive the word of God from us, he's saying they, you know, go back and look at the record in Acts 17. They went to preach the good news of Jesus, the gospel that Jesus makes reconciliation with God possible. And the Thessalonians, or the Thessalonians, however you prefer to say it, they, they received the word of God. Now, behind receiving the word of God that Christ reconciles men to God, men and women to God, we also, in receiving that word, receive his lordship, and then the rest of the, you know, the entirety of the word of God works in us to bring about a continued set-apartness, sanctification, uh, becoming more like Jesus. Okay? So I open with this very long um, introduction, you know, one, this personal testimony of how the word was used by the spirit to, to really bring me into salvation. And then, you know, what's funny is, I'm not saying I'm the Apostle Paul. Nobody hear that. But what's funny is I get how the Apostle Paul was a massive student of the word. And when he got saved, he then began to deploy, deploy the word under the direction of the Holy Spirit with a brand new understanding. He came apart for a time. And, and, and I think, you know, part of what happened when Paul after Paul was saved and he went apart into Arabia, as we usually say, the, the spirit was causing him to see all this theological knowledge through the lens of its, of its, of its um, Christ-centric point. It wasn't just a law for man to, you know, under his own steam, do something to please God. No, the law was about Jesus. Um, the wisdom was about Jesus. The poetry was about Jesus. The history um, was really about Jesus. So Paul Paul had a reorientation in the word. And I want to tell you, I'm not saying I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm not saying Apostle Paul is any better than me or any worse than me. I'm, I'm just saying we all know an incredible impact God used him to have. I'm not the Apostle Paul. But I get that illustration. To me, I'm using it as an illustrative metaphor. I understand what it's like to be in the word for years and then suddenly have the Holy Spirit in you, and then that that word begins to get energetic movement in a way before it had never had. It might have been um, advice here and there, an interesting story here and there, a principle to be applied here and there, but the word began to have energetic working. And then the second thing I say is, you know, let's make sure we're about the gospel, the gospel. And let's not mislabel things gospel. You know, let's not say gospel music when it ain't gospel music. It could just be spiritual music. But gospel is the good news. So if it's if it's a, if if it's music of the gospel, it will be music proclaiming the good news that Christ reconciles man to God. Okay. That being said, that being said as a setup, I think it's I think it's awesome. It's an awesome weight getting ready to be handed to us. Um, um, wow, my phone just rang. How about that? Hmm. I wonder, can I go back and edit that out? Who knows? If I don't, everybody have a laugh. Um... 
I just got an old new phone. Maybe we'll just leave the laugh in here. Here's the laugh. I was having some trouble with my my fancy phone, so I got my old new phone out. It was I've been headed for a while, but I got it out, and it doesn't have a um, it doesn't have a button where you can say "Don't ring," and uh, I forgot to cut it off. Okay, there's our one minute interruption. Whoa, it freaked me out for a second. Um, okay, where was I? Lord help me, Jesus. Here we go. Um, I want to give three big ideas, three big ideas tonight. And I think this is so, I think what I'm saying is so important. It's so important that we, we adopted ourselves. We ourselves take on this understanding. And it's so important as we minister, as we become ambassadors I heard a guy this morning call, call you know, uh, say the ambassadors of the embassy of grace, and you know what is the what is grace is that is that God has given us un his unmerited favor in sending Jesus to reconcile man and God. We become ambassadors not just of random good works, but of the gospel from the embassy of grace. So I believe today's word is really critical for our personal ministries, okay? Um, and I think this is really important. Um, uh, someone will hear me saying, wow, he's talking about the culture wars. Well, it's useful in that too, but that's not the point. My point is, like, if you want to get into the culture wars, I... I I'll have that discussion with anybody about any topic. I don't claim to have my own view of it. I'm only going to search the scriptures and try to take on God's view of it. Okay. I'll have that. I'll, I'll have that discussion with anyone. Right. But I believe the most effective thing is to, is to be ambassadors of God carrying the gospel. All right. So, Let's go back to the passage with this super long intro, which I believe, still believe is very important. And let's look at three huge ideas, okay? The Bible says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 13, that those believers in Thessalonians are commended because they received the word and accepted it as not from men, Okay. So let's draw, let's draw the conclusion, the one big idea from this. When they received the word of God, they received it as a command over their whole entire life. They did not categorize their hearing of the word of God. They accepted its authority over every part of their life, okay? It says they, they received it by the hearing of the ear. It's like uh, getting a certified letter and there being proof. You know, you sign the thing and there's proof that the post, the postman, the delivery person handed it to someone and that that someone signed it. Who I mean, received it? Who received it? So they received it. It's that sort of imagery. But not only did they receive it, but they accepted it. They welcomed it. It's like uh, working uh, the front door of, of a place, being a greeter, right? And you, you open the door for someone, you receive them, come in. But then you say, come in with me. You know, you, you know come in and come in with me. I, 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 I received you and I accept you. Now, could you imagine, could you imagine uh, a total stranger coming to you and you saying, come in. I receive you, now tell me what to do in everything. That's the imagery here. You received it and you accepted it, okay? Why did they do that? Because they recognized that it was a word from God. Now, you say it's from people because people delivered it. Paul and his missionary team delivered it. Yeah, but it's like that certified letter. They're delivering it. It's not. You know, it's not the postman's certified letter. The certified letter is sent from someone, 
delivered by someone, signed by someone, received by someone, then will it be accepted? Mm. The way it became so powerful to the believers in Thessal uh, Thessalonica is that they received it not like some guy had given them some self-help advice. They received it like, this is what God said. Now, that's where some people struggle. That's where some people struggle. They say um, they're very critical of the word of God. And, and, and I'm, I, man, I can spend some time debating that too, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm just going to give these three quick pieces of counsel. The first two might be, you know, an A and a B. Um, whenever somebody's giving you, you know, some some beef about the Bible, or if you're giving yourself beef about the Bible, or you're believing the devil's uh, junk about the Bible, um, do these three things, just if you're willing. One, see what the Bible says about the Bible. The Bible purports that it is the word from God, okay? And there's like three sentences in the whole Bible where God says, and here's my opinion. True story. So see what the Bible says about itself. S secondly, see what Jesus says about the Bible. Like when Jesus talks about people like, like Jonah, he doesn't, he doesn't switch up his beliefs. Uh, it, it's not contrary to the word. When he talks about the creation, uh, you know, so so if Jesus believes a word, right? How can we believe in a Jesus who doesn't believe the word? A lot of that going on in liberal Christianity, which is more liberal than it is Christianity, if it ever was Christianity. Yeah, I said it. I'll stick by it. Just pray my phone don't ring again. So what does the Bible say about itself? Look at what Jesus believed about the Bible. And, you know, either if we're going to believe on Jesus, you know, if the evidence is there to believe on Jesus, and I believe it is, then his testimony about the Bible is pretty critical. Thirdly, just read it. Read it. Trust the Holy Spirit to work. Now, take these same things and you think about all right, if you're ministering to someone. Walk with him what the Bible says about itself. Walk with him what, what Jesus, you know, the evidence in the scriptures, what Jesus believed about the Bible. Read the Bible together and trust the Holy Spirit. If the Bible comes from man, okay, we, we, we can legitimately uh, criticize it and, and criticize the man or woman or whatever. If it comes from man, we can look at the man and say, is this legitimate? We can look at the word and say, is that legitimate? But if the Bible comes from God, it criticizes us. If the Bible comes from man, we can sit in judgment over that man and the Bible. If the Bible comes from God, it sits in judgment over us. Somebody say amen. So big idea number one and we see it here from the, the Thessal Thessalonians, is that when they when they received the Bible and accepted, they accepted it as from God and therefore recognized it has authority over every area of their lives. Every area of their lives. What it reveals to us about Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Those are the believer's answers about those things. Those are the believer's answers about those things. And we don't pick and choose. If you want a Jesus out of salvation which is what the Bible offers, if you want a Christ of salvation, a Messiah who delivers, then we also have to receive the Messiah who commands. And that's where the, the Thessalonians have a lot to teach us. They receive the word of God, which they heard, they heard through people, but they didn't say it's from those people. They heard it through the people, but they said it's from God. This is where prepositions and prepositional phrases really matter, huh? It gets exciting. Grammar. 
So Paul says, look, we really thank God that when God sent us there with the gospel, you, you, you received it, you accepted it, came through here, into here, dripped down to here, so it became, it became reason and affection. And you didn't say this comes from Paul and Silas and those boys. You didn't say, you said this came through them from God. Big deal. You know, there's a, there, I mean, I, I don't even want to go through it, but there, Joel Osteen, right? He, he'll, he'll tell everybody at the beginning of his broadcast to hold up their Bible and they'll say some little thing like, this is God's word, it's to me, and uh, it says what it says. And then he goes about basically ignoring what it says. I mean, that's unmitigated hogwash. It's from God, all right? Then he says something pretty cool in verse, yes, I'm still on verse 13. <laughs> I blame it all on the phone ringing, right? He says, uh, which is at work. It's at work in you believers. I actually would love to just, just, just take some time and just really deal with that. That's a pretty neat phrase. It's at work. How does the word of God work in you? Let, let me let me let me give two let me give two cool examples. Two cool examples. Um, let's look at an example from Isaiah fifty five. Oh, there it went. Isaiah fifty. Oh, I passed it. Isaiah fifty five. Listen to verses ten and eleven. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. All right. So, you know, in... in in oversimplified Tim talk, how is the word working in believers like rain, like rain, like snow, like water from heaven? It is conveying life to our souls. You know, the, the whatever's in the ground, it will, it will, you know, drive and die, right? That water. And so the word, the word, is like rain, like snow, uh, bringing life-giving water to the believer. Okay. Um, this is one of these places we can stop and say a lot about what the word says about this very activity. You know how we've been um, born again of the of the imperishable, not of the perishable. Uh, through the living and abiding word of God, as the apostle Peter says in 1 Peter one twenty three, or, or, or how Jesus prayed in John 17, sanctify them by your truth because your word is truth. Um, we, you know, it is a life-giving water to us. And so some, many believers live in a state of drought because of how much they ignore the word. I was listening to this pastor named Colin Smith out of, um, I think he's in Chicago at a church called The Orchard. Um, I heard him one time um, at, a, at a convention and started listening to his podcast. I um, listen to it weekly now, and it's pretty interesting. And he was saying the other day how uh, one of his congregants had uh, had a you know heart episode and had to radically change his diet and all this stuff. And and he said the guy was you know hating it, and I was like, man, I would too. You can't eat this. You got to eat that. Like, whoa, I would hate that. And he was saying some weeks later, he asked the guy, says, how's it going? He says, not as bad as I thought, okay? Because, and here was, here was, here was Colin Smith's illustration. The gentleman was forced to change his diet. And when he changed his diet, it changed his tastes. I think that goes on a lot with believers. You know, we are starving, right? Because we are starving of the word and then we don't have a taste for the word. But if we'll feast on the word, it, the changed diet will change our appetites, right? So Paul's commendation to the believers in in uh, Thessalonica was that they um 
They received the word and accepted the word as it was from God, and the word was at work in them. Well, I just realized what time it is. I got a long ways to go. Well, let me give you one more quick example from one of my favorite Psalms. This is Psalm 19. You want to you wanna, you wanna study how, how the word works? Study Psalm 119. But uh, this little bit comes from Psalm 19. This is, uh, uh, let me read uh, four verses here, starting in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Let me go ahead and add verse 11. Moreover, by them is your servant warned in keeping them. There is great reward. Wow. Wow. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11 is what I just read. Just go read that. The word will work many things in our lives. If we accept it, if we receive it, accept it as from God, right? It will water our souls and it will begin to do many works in our lives. Many, many works in our lives. Let's go back and look at some of those descriptive words. And I just see I got eight minutes to do my whole other two points. Oh my goodness. Okay. I think our second huge lesson comes to us from verse 14. It says, says this, let me read it again. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea for you suffered. If we receive a word from God in a world that is separated from God, we will suffer as we stand with God because that world hates God. One of the tests that Paul says of these believers, the test that they have passed in a very strong way, he says, I know y'all received the word because it cost you. Your countrymen rejected you. You suffered because you received and accepted this word from God. It changed things in your lives. It caused you to challenge things in your culture, and you suffered because of that. When we accept the Bible, we will have opposition. Now, I know everybody out there has got opinions, you know, and we all know what opinions are like, right? But when it comes to all these social issues of the day, There's nothing in me that wants to demean people who have a struggle within them. But there's also nothing in me that is willing to change what God says. So there's the tension. I love people. I believe God. Okay. And sometimes people, people get that really mixed up. They say, if I, if I love people, I've got to disregard what God says. I got to find a way to change what God says. Or if I believe God, I've got to, you know, be angry or reject people who don't believe God. No, I believe we can love people and believe God. And I'm telling you, if we stand with God, it's going to flat out cost us in this world. It is going to cost us in this world. A lot of you, I don't, I don't even know if anybody who's in high school is even going to watch this, but one of the most dangerous grounds for your faith is your friends. When you believe the word of God and they tell you something you believe is antiquated or mean or whatever, <clears throat> and, you, and you shift what you believe to go along with what they say, dangerous territory, okay? Because thirdly and, 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 and lastly and quickly, if you look at, if you look, if you look at the last two verses, it says when they, re when the Jews rejected the early church in, in Judea and when the pagan world rejected the early church in the Roman empire, you know, uh, what happened is it was because Jesus, 
Jesus was pronouncing judgment on culture, and so culture rejected that judgment by pronouncing the people who stood with Jesus. And uh, that's one of the toughest things about being a Christian in a culture that is rapidly separating itself from God. We want to get along with folks. And so rather than rather than loving people while standing true in the right word, a lot of times we we withdraw from people or we join them. And, and in withdrawing, a lot of times we feel like, well, you know, great, I'm over here believing God. When God says, go take my word to people. <laughs> so we got to get out there. And, you know, you can't cut off somebody's nose and hand them a rose, you know. Um, we have to find a way to lovingly put that message out there. But when we do, when we do put the gospel out there, what does it say? It says, man is born dead in his trespasses and sins, separated from the 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 uh, separated from peace with God, deserving of His just wrath, and the only way to escape it is to come into the safe ark that is Jesus. People are not going to like that message, and some people are going to say, "Well, you know, you Christians believe this, that, and the third. You know, you believe this about gender. You believe this about sex. You believe this about money. You believe this about um, power and politics. You, you you know, you believe this about." Um, <clears throat> the home and, and, and roles and equality and blah, blah, blah. You know, all the things that people will throw in a Christian's face. And we say, yes, yes, we believe the Bible and we accept its authority over every area of our lives. Society is going to hate that because people love darkness rather than light. These believers, according to verses 15 and 16, right? They... They stood against the opposition. They accepted the opposition. They accepted the judgment because they knew that they had gotten a word from God and they received it as from God. And I mean, just, just look at the, the things that Paul says right here. He, he says, look, you're going to be treated in your pagan world just like we're being treated in our Jewish world. And what did our Jewish world do? They killed Jesus and the prophets. They they um they drove out the apostles from Jerusalem. They uh, are hostile to 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 everyone speaking the truth, and they desire to hinder the preaching of the gospel. You can expect that opposition when you believe the Bible. When you stand on the Bible, when you say this is a word from God, this is the word from God. Society is not going to like it. It is not going to like it. So some of you may or may not know this. I um, I write a little, a, a weekly, it's not a little, but I write a weekly article for our paper here in Person County. And um, for every, you know, one person says, hey, thank you for that a column or, or, hey, I read your column, made me think this good thing or whatever. You know, I get, I don't even know the ratio. I, I have no problem saying it's minimum 20 to one. I probably believe it's 50 to one of people who say bad things to me, you know, um, uh, coming in June, I, I, you know, I wrote the article last night, but I think it's dropping in June 10th or something like that. You know, I, I talk about like, is what is it like to be really converted? I already know I'm going to hear some junk out of that one. I'm going to hear some junk from the, <clears throat> the Christian crowd on that one. Right. But, As the French would say, c'est la vie. I know that where that Bible rejecting, word of God rejecting mentality is going to lead. The Apostle Paul says it's going to lead this. They are going to heap up their sins to the limit, over the brim, and God's wrath is going to come upon them. And I feel no superiority about that. I'm not happy that there are people who oppose the word of God, that the wrath of God is going to come down on them. As a matter of fact, I want to spend my life breath helping people escape the coming wrath of God. I mean, you know, God does all the work. I'm just a, I'm just a herald. So I know where that's going. And I know that, you know, if, you know, if I live to be you know, 65, 70, 75, whatever God has in mind for me, if I get hated on uh, for the next 10, 15, 20, 25, 40 years, however long God's going to have me leave, 
I am secure in God's love for eternity. And I'll take that. I'll take that. Whereas if people are comfortable and accepted and popular in the world and they live here for 120 years under such acceptance, they will stand in front of holy God and there will be an eternity of wrath and separation. Okay, so, um, accept God's word as the authority over every arena of life, which will put us in opposition and under the judgment of the word of the world. And Paul's commendation is that they received it and accepted it and it was working in them because they knew it was from God and not from man. And they wanted what God was delivering to them through his messengers. I know I'm over my time and I'm not even, man, I'm not even close to being done with my notes. Um, let's just look, we'll put them in the trash. Cut the video off, plug the phone back up. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. This is, this is a power packed passage for me. And I pray that somebody got some blessing out of it. Much love and peace.